Hello, everyone. Welcome to Measuring the Score podcast, the podcast where we offer our opinions on film scores and the films they're inspired by. I'm Chris. And I'm Leslie. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to Measuring the Score. This is episode three. Today we're going to be talking about Child's Play 2. But before we do, I have to kind of clear something up. In episode two, I said that Alan Silvestri created the theme for Chips. I was completely wrong about that. Alan Silvestri created the score for some of the episodes of Chips. I completely apologize about that film scoring podcast. And, you know, I get that wrong in episode two. That's fantastic so i apologize <laughs> Let's, we're gonna move on now um yeah so today we're gonna be talking about child's play 2 now leslie you were not very excited about this one no not really i'm not a big horror fan um a lot of the movies i like i like uh dramas and and fantasy and documentaries that sort of thing but horror it does not rank in my my top favorites um and i i have seen some of the child's play movies but i have never seen this one this was a first for me we'll see that i am a big horror movie fan i mean i got an entire bookshelf dedicated to just horror films and they're like two dvd width size a piece <laughs> oh i know i've helped you put that shelf together <laughs> yes and it was a fun day too <laughs> at least you didn't have to alphabetize them yeah well, no, we categorize them by uh, by film. That's still better than alphabetizing. We'd yeah, be here but, forever. Yeah, good Lord of mercy. We'd type it in an Excel spreadsheet and hit sort. <laughs> <laughs> that I think that would might have worked out the best if we had done that. No, actually. that that part would be the easy part. Then finding the ones. Yeah, that is true. That is <laughs> to that put is in very, very order true. would not be easy. <laughs> I I was I, I'm the one who picked this one uh, this week because I, I the score was only available through a promotional release from the uh, composer Graham Revel or Revel I cannot pronounce his last name I if I butcher it I apologize um, but uh, the score it was only available through promotional release and the only way you could find it was through bootlegs. And for the longest time, I could only hear it on YouTube. Well, La La Land Records finally released the score on CD. And this was several years back. Well, they finally released it on Spotify. And I was like a little kid when they finally released it on Spotify. And I don't know if you remember, I came home from work. I'm like, they released it on Spotify. And you're like, what? I'm like, Child's Play 2. And you're like, yay. Yeah. (laughs) I'm just like, why is he so hyped up about this? (laughs) Well, and I, I... it wasn't just me. It was a lot of people. And I noticed that. Yeah, there when was doing a lot. research at the back of this movie. Right, and there was a lot of people that was super excited that this score was finally released on Spotify. And some of the background for the score, one of the conductors is Shirley Walker. Shirley Walker um, created the uh, score for Final Destination 1, 2, and 3, but also worked on the Batman animated series. Uh, she worked with Danny Elfman a lot, and but also she worked with, uh, I believe her name was Wendy Carlos, I could be wrong, who did The Shining. It was Wendy Carlos and, and Shirley Walker kind of working together on the score. I remember her name from Batman. And she she is the only one that I know of, that I have heard. I, there, there may be several similar instances, but on the Final Destination DVD, she got her very own commentary. Nobody else. It was just her. They even isolated the score. That tells you something about the score and tells you something about her. So for her to be involved with this film, you know, with the score at least, was was really big to me. Now, this was Graham's first big orchestra score. Universal asked him, had he ever worked with a big orchestra score? He called their bluff, and they ended up hiring him. So he kind of lied to get this job. He had only done smaller ensembles. So I thought well, that was that's funny because our last episode, 
he he also worked with a smaller ensemble. He hadn't worked with the orchestra that size. Exactly. So yeah, that's a theme. Huh? Hey, there's another <laughs> theme going on here too. So our very first episode was Jaws, directed by Steven Spielberg, and that which he produced Back to the Future. Now, uh, there's a character named Phil, and he's played by Garrett Graham. He played Jeff in Used Cars, which was directed by Robert Zemeckis, produced by Steve, you know it's produced by Steven Spielberg. Spielberg actually helped make Child's Play 2. He helped David Kirshner, the producer, go to Universal because MGM was being bought out by another, by another company. They didn't want to make horror films anymore, so they gave the rights to David Kirshner. They were trying to find a uh, studio. There were several different offers. Universal was very interested. Spielberg is the one who went to David Kirshner and said, hey, go to Universal, sit down and talk to him. And you know, the rest is history in which spanned a very long line of uh, films, you know, of Chucky. And see, that was not planned out. No. That's the first I've heard of that. So that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we were just picking movies. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I thought that was, that, that was kind of neat. Cause when I started, you know, reading all the backstory and everything else, and I, I remember seeing Garrett Graham in Charles play too. I saw him first before I saw, used cars so to see him in used cars i'm like hey that's the dad from child's play too <laughs> but the, the one thing that always stood out for me as a kid was the score for this film so listening to the score on its own uh it it starts off big strong and bold yeah, that was the first thing I noticed about the score was the fact that it sounded like an old monster movie. It was really grandiose, and uh, it put me in mind of Frankenstein or one of the the old, you know, black and white uh, monster films. Right, and, and it does. It has this big, huge, grandioso uh, style to it, and it's it's. It's like, really epically done. Right, epic. Yeah, yeah, that's the word I was trying to find. It's really <laughs> epic. And, and and it's not really what you would think for a film about a killer doll until like toward the end of the opening theme, you get this weird circusy uh, fun house almost sound with a with a um oh what's the word I'm looking for like a music box. Right. Yeah. And, and there's uh it sounds almost like a uh, um maybe pan flutes. I mean, they're, they're, you know, do, 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 do. Yeah. I mean, you guys know what I'm talking about. I, but this, this weird. Fun child, housey, Yeah. Fun house, childlike theme comes into play. And that's the theme you're going to hear throughout the rest of the film. That's pretty much Chucky's theme. And I thought that was great. That, that to me is one of my favorite parts of this score is Chucky's theme. And I noticed that, you know, so it begins with this big, grandiose sounding um, sound, and then uh, it starts to gradually uh, morph into a more, you know, modern horror type score. Um, So there were modern horror elements that I've noticed in it with the slides um, and those sounds like that. And then, then you had this one piece... Uh, called the burial, which they bring in the organ. organ, right? And that kind of reminded me very much of uh, almost Bach-like. You've got this organ playing, and it, you know, listening to the score itself to me was out of place. It was out of place in the score. It, it really is, and, and you can tell too because it, the, you go from the big, huge, epic, grandioso theme to to it where it kind of it really slows down a little bit. You get some pieces in there that are going up and down, you know, the modern re, re, sound, the really big hits and stuff like that. And then you come to this organ track, and you're just like, well, it does, it does not fit the style, it does not fit the storytelling, it does not fit with what's going on. Yeah, it kind of reminded me of like uh, Dark Shadows or Dracula yeah. or something, you know, with this organ piece. And I'm like, that's bizarre, even though I love, Bach is my favorite composer. I love organ music. So yeah, it piqued my interest because it was an organ and I really liked it. But I'm like, does it fit in this scenario? And I felt like it didn't, just listening to the score. Right. And then the score keeps going. And then there's uh, another track later on, Yardstick. And this is 
for a scene in the film where this teacher is getting harassed with a, you know, she's getting killed with a yardstick. And the 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 Chucky's theme comes back, but it comes back even more childlike. I'm pretty sure it sounded like they used a lot of children's instruments for this piece right here because it was just it was steadily going, steadily going, and steadily building. And then the orchestra, you know, get, gets really, really, really loud with these three huge hits, and then it just kind of dies off and everything else. And then the the score it, it really takes a a thriller um, esque feel to it it, it kind of drops the monster movie but there's throughout it still has this old school versus modern play yeah yeah and and that's what that was one thing i really did like about it because there there was even moments um i can't i can't remember the name of the track exactly but it was where andy's down in the basement and he, he's got the electric knife and I mean, it may have been the track may have been like electric knife and he, you hear very subtly uh, a violin, a solo violin playing a, as he's walking around. That was kind of uncommon for 1990, 1991. I mean, even now, it it was it was really it was really nice to hear that. It was, you, you hear all these more modern instruments going, and then you hear the solo violin very subtly in there. I thought that was very cool how he did that. And you know, I like the score for what it was worth um, listening to it I I did enjoy the score um, you know I don't know all of the terminology that uh, they use in horror music um, they had a lot of um, as I call them slides you ha- you said it the it other was, day uh, glissandos yeah glissandos yeah glissandos glissandos um, th- that was like scattered throughout throughout the score which is a nice touch because it's a horror score i like the fact that they did play old versus new um as far as i wonder if that was intentional i I wonder if it was supposed to be or if it was just graham's um um, i guess you could say his, his lack of knowledge with the with the bigger orchestra maybe maybe he was just trying something trying to do what he could i personally feel you know my opinion is that uh, he was playing with sounds um, because we, we'll talk about it when we get to the movie section um, and how I feel how the score is with the movie. But, you know, listening to the score, it sounds like he was playing with sounds and getting more comfortable with his surroundings, getting more comfortable with the instruments that he, you know, had at his disposal. Um, but, you know, inadvertently he did create this this sound where they sound like the two pieces are battling because you have the old, you have the new, and then there's this, you know, a fun house type of music that. Well, let's say that's the childlike innocence of the score trying to break through, trying to break through the old and the new. Quite possible, but you know, you know, it's Chucky's theme and it, you know, he inadvertently created a theme for Chucky. And, um, because the first film, um, was, composed by Joe Renzetti, completely different composer. And Chucky didn't really have, I mean, he had a theme, but it wasn't a, a very rhythmic theme like this here. No, uh, it wasn't rhythmic at all. It, it was, it was more, it, I, I, I don't know the instruments exactly, but it could have been like a water phone and a, a cymbal using like a, a felt drum, um, drumstick slowly rubbing on the cymbal, creating this weird, almost whale-like sound. And that was played throughout the whole score for that film. It's been so long since I've heard it by itself. But for Child's Play 2, the film itself has a very fun house feel to it. So I, that that kind of kind of works. But I did, I, just listening to it on its own, you, you hear all of this. You hear all these elements come together. Ba- almost battling, but they also work. They work, and, you know, I feel like the score itself could stand alone um, by itself. So if you listen to the score without even watching the movie, uh, you would get enjoyment out of listening to the score because of all these elements that come together. And the one thing that the score has going for it, there is a sense of dread throughout the entire thing. I mean, it's just constant dread. I mean, is there's something, there's something there, there's something wrong there's something weird there's something in the shadows there's something in the dark it's always there and then as the score keeps going it it, it kind of takes on a, almost a an action-esque element it, to it you know and i f- i felt like it was more 
in my opinion, it was more light. It was not as some of these creepy scores that you hear now with some of these these darker movies like Insidious or um, you know these these uh, dark scores that you hear. This one kind of had a, a light-hearted feel to it, even though there was a sense of dread. It it wasn't it it wasn't um, I would say extreme horror as I would well, you also explain this about the time too because this is 1990 1991 so that dark element of horror it was probably explored in other films but not with this score yeah. and again it may fall back onto this was his first big orchestral score because I've heard a lot of stuff from this guy before later on in his career and there there is very dark especially when he came back for bride of chucky that that is a very dark sounding and gothic score whereas child's play 2 is not it is very lighter now there are parts of the score listening to it someone that kind of threw me for a loop it, it, there there's this snare drum coming in there and it sounds almost military like oh yeah that, it was really bizarre <laughs> it, i'm like it, why why does he choose the the snare i mean there's other instruments that he could have um, picked that maybe would have created that same effect he was looking for, but he picked a snare. So in doing so, it sounded very, uh, very much like a military march. And, and it does. It sounds like somebody's going on a march, or, or they're in the military, and they're in the, you know, soldiers coming after Chucky or something like that, which that happens in the third film. But still, it it just kind of comes out of nowhere because you got this big orchestra swells coming in. All of a sudden, you hear the. It, it, it almost doesn't work, but at the same time, it kind of does, but not not really, I guess you could say. And then it, there there's this uh, uh, the track where they're running through the entire uh, maze. It's like a labyrinth. I believe the track name is Labyrinth. I I love this track because it's the scene where they're running through all the different uh, good guy doll maze and everything, and then Chucky starts chasing them up the the. Uh, um, uh, little shaft, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I, I like that track. <laughs> I don't, but the one thing that threw you off was the bongos. <laughs> yes, I didn't understand that as a like the snare drum. I did not understand that <laughs> choice of instrument. I'm like, yeah, this now sounds comic, like it's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Anytime I hear bongos, I think of funny. I don't know why. Anytime I hear bongos, I think of um, uh, Mission Impossible. <laughs> well, if, if you listen to the score for Mission Impossible <laughs> Fallout, every time there's action, you're going to hear bongos. But it, uh, the way the bongos are used, they're, they're very, very serious. So I liked it. I don't know. But again, same thing with Child's Play 2. It, to me, it worked. For you, it didn't. <laughs> Yeah, no. I felt like it, I felt like it was a poor choice of instrument. As an in Indiana Jones three, you chose poorly. It's always going to come back to John Williams. Yeah, you chose poorly. <laughs> I see. Again, you didn't really like it. I did. I like the bongos. Keep the bongos in there. Okay. Well, if it was me, I would not have used them. To I would each have their own. <laughs> He chose wisely. <laughs> okay. Let's agree to disagree. I'm fine. Uh, but no, and the score keeps going and it keeps, you know, more that, that grandioso feel comes back towards the end of the score. Whereas in the middle, it kind of takes a, a slow thriller-esque feel to it with a couple of bigger moments in there. The end of the score brings that big, grandioso feel that was very prominent at the very beginning of the score back for the ending. And it, that kind of rounded it out. So yeah. it, it ended like where it began. Very grand. Uh, after it took this journey, you know, through the middle. So Right. And and, and it really it really told a story with just the score itself. And I, I did like that, listening to it on its own again for about the eighth time. <laughs> <laughs> I, see, I, I he's like, partial, everybody. Yeah. Well, I'm not really partial. I, I, I was. It was kind of hard for me to go back and listen to it and be judgmental because doing that, it was. I was finding a lot of stuff in there. I'm going, why? Why did this happen? What was in yeah, here? Yeah, see, that's like Back to the Future. Yeah, exactly. Because I, I love that movie so much, and then when you start comparing the score and looking at it from a different perspective, then it changes things. It does. 
It really, it really does because th- there was a, there were a lot of moments in there. I'm sitting there. I was kind of putting myself in a position of if I was scoring this, what would I have done differently? I would have made the score a lot darker than what it was because there was a lot of moments in there where it sounded a little lighter than what it needed to be. Yeah, it's very comic like, right? Even, even like I said, even excluding that it was 1990, 1991, there was a lot of darker scores at that time. So. I would have went into a different direction, but it, there there were so many different elements going on. The director could have wanted it this way. The composer, you know, his first time big orchestra film. The studio. There's no telling what the factors were at that time. I agree. So then we sat down and watched the film. <laughs> So, as I said before, this is the first time I've ever sat down and watched Child of Play 2. Yeah, you, so, you, you've seen Child's Play 1. Yes. And you've seen Seed of Chucky. You've seen Bride of Chucky. I've seen Bride of Chucky. You've seen Seed of Chucky. I've seen Seed of Chucky. I've seen the new one. You've seen Curse and Cult of Chucky. Mm-hmm. Okay. But so you've I, never seen Child's Play I've 2. I've never seen the second one. So, I, A, I did not know what I was expecting. B, I know Chris, you know, because he is a big Child's Play (laughs) fan, was excited. So I'm like, well, maybe I'll give it a chance. We'll see where this goes. And then the opening scene happened. And I'm like, oh, my, this is way too much music (laughs) for just a limousine speeding through the city. Well, see, this is where I disagree with you. I mean, and and excluding the the fact that I'm, I'm a fan of this franchise and a fan of this film, to me, it was more... I wasn't looking at it that it was a limousine driving down the city. Uh, to me, it was the resurrection of Chucky. Yeah, there was a limousine driving through the city, and it was coming to the good guy factory. But to me, it was the resurrection of Chucky. So that's where I, I kind of feel the music was fine where it yeah, was. Yeah, no, I felt like it was too much. <laughs> I'm like, that's it's just too much for a limousine driving through the city. <laughs> I'm like, wow. I'm like, I loved listening to it just in the score. But then when you put the limousine factor <laughs> in and I'm like, yeah, that's not working for me. So, no, it didn't work for me. <laughs> for me, it did. And, and and like I said, excluding the fact that I'm a fan of the film and the score, I, I still looked at it very judgmental. And I was like, to me, it still works. I would have done that. Well, there were parts in the movie also um, where I sat down and watched and wished he would have added uh, some more music. So the first part that I've seen that I wish maybe there was should have been music added was uh, the mom when or the the foster mom when she went to go open the door and show Andy his new room. Yes, Andy and I felt a theme. like he needed either a theme or they needed to add some music there. She opens the door to show him the room, but there was nothing. So I, you know, I was left wanting something there. There was no connection. There was con- no connection to the character. No connection to the scene until. The the Tommy he starts doll, looking at the toys. The yes. Tommy doll falls out of the closet, and there's a big scare. And that was the one thing I started noticing. The only time there was score was when there was a scare scene. Well, and some of that too was over the top, and um, or if there was some action going on, it was kind of over the top, like uh, the scene where the teacher was getting killed. And to me, that was just way too much music. For that Again, scene. listening to the score on its own, it was fine. It worked. It told the story. For the film itself, for it some did reason, not work. it didn't work. No. It, there should have been maybe a percussion hit just signifying the whole yardstick, which would not have happened. I mean, come on, let's just be real. The teacher would not have been killed by a yardstick. <laughs> And yes, she would have. And here's she would have got a massive splinter. <laughs> <laughs> Blood to death, died. I mean, okay, the air pump to the lungs, yes. That that would have oh, caused... to it. the heart. It wasn't oh, to the lungs. Well, whatever. I, yeah, that would have caused some serious damage. And, but right, the yardstick, yeah. no. Yeah, in which I even said this when I was, you know, all, throughout the years when I would watch this film, there's no way she would have died from a yardstick. I just thought it was kind of hokey and that the music was too too big for Especially that for that scene. I yeah. Think. Especially now, then scene. you get to the part where Andy is walking around the basement and, you know, like I talked about it before with the electric knife and everything else. But one of the things I did notice, again, like I was talking about how the solo violin comes in and everything else. You don't hear that in the film. No, and you don't. You did not hear the organ playing in the Which, burial scene. Yeah, the, the burial scene. I almost forgot that. The burial scene 
it, where you hear this huge organ and everything else that is replaced by something else. And it sounds like it, it, which there was a track, some tracks in there where it had this nice wind sound in there. That's what was in place. So I guess the director, producers, whoever heard the organ piece and they noticed it did not work. Yeah. In hindsight, you know, if they would have put that organ piece in there, even though I liked it in the score, I would not have liked it in the movie because, you know, as we've just been discussing, I feel like uh, there were places that the music was over the top and that definitely would have been one of them. It didn't fit. It wouldn't, have fit, it wouldn't have fit it at all. Not, it did not fit the score. It did not fit the film. So that was actually a good choice right there to cut that out. Now, there was a scene where the foster mom is singing a song to Andy. And I started joking because the way she started off is almost sounded like Godfather. I And, you know, I'm so gullible, guys. And I thought <laughs> that he really, he, she really was singing the Godfather. And I'm like, what? They put that in this movie? And then I'm like, oh, he's making fun of me. I see Could what's you happening imagine here. That? Could you imagine <laughs> let's let's just stop and think about this for a second. Okay, you know, this Andy this poor kid, I feel I feel bad for him. You feel so bad for Andy because, you know, he No one believes him. No one believes him. I mean he wouldn't have had to go through this the first time around. No one believed him that this doll was going around killing people and then he's having to go through it all over again. But he's not around his mom. He just got into some new home and, it, and this woman starts singing the Godfather thing. <laughs> Could you imagine what what would be your thought if you had to go I'd to be a like, foster? Oh, this is twisted. This is not just a horror movie. This is a twisted. No, 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 no. Movie. Put yourself in the shoes of the kid. If you were sitting there and this woman, you know, you just met, you know, she's all warm and cuddly. Also, she starts going. You're not right, Chris. <laughs> not right. Not at all. Oh, that would be great. <laughs> I would love to see that in a film. We need to we need to make a movie like that. It's like this foster kid. He, spoof. He, yeah, no, 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 not a spoof. Just like straight up serious movie. All of a sudden, <laughs> straight this, up yeah, straight up serious movie. And all of a sudden, put this in this foster mom. She's all loving and caring. Also, she starts going. Dee, 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 well, you know, dee. he's scared at that point anyway because he just saw the Tommy doll. <laughs> so that poor kid, we ruined for life. <laughs> Uh, oh yes, the Tommy doll. Now, which the Tommy doll was named after Tom Holland, the director of the first Child's Play film. So I thought that was kind of neat. Yeah, which, you were just so full of useful knowledge that you told me that when we were watching. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I didn't know that. I really didn't, and it, you know. But I've which, really never been and, interested. And, and Tom Holland is a very sweetheart of a guy. I've talked to him on Facebook a couple of times. And very nice gentleman. He really is. Because I talked to him when uh, Tom Holland, the uh, the actor who plays Spider Man, got the role. Everybody was congratulating Tom Holland, the director, on Twitter, saying "Congratulations!" So I remember him posting a picture. You know, and I, th- I believe Tom's in his seventies right now. And if you're not Tom, I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but he, everybody, he's like, "Yeah, thanks." <laughs> but that was kind of funny. Well, yes, the the Tommy doll is named after Tom Holland, and I thought that was kind of cool. And then Chucky, you know, you know, goes and destroys his face with a vase. I thought it was, was no, like, it was uh, a collectible, knick-knack. yeah, a collectible knickknack. I'm sorry, it was, it was passed <laughs> down in their family because <laughs> you know that collectible knickknack looked like something from the 70s. So I highly doubt it was passed down. In their It was very old, is the woman explained. Oh, yeah, very old. <laughs> then he goes, who is this going to go to? And then she looked away. <laughs> like, not you, kid. Yeah, seriously. That was the one thing, though. You did feel bad for the kid. And that was another thing, too. There was another moment. You feel bad for him, but yet there's no score to kind of signify his no, sadness. No, there's, you know, as we've talked before about how some... um composers uh use the quirkiness of their characters to influence their music uh composition and there was no no feeling in this score granted it is a horror movie but there there were some moments where you you would like to have known what andy was thinking or you'd like to have heard in the music what andy was feeling and there was nothing it was just straight up okay uh this you know, death scene, we're going to put some music here. Oh, this is a action scene, we're going to put some music here. But in those in-between moments, or you, you don't hear anything. And so it made me wanting more in those spots. 
um, and that we didn't get in the film. Right. And then when it comes to the point, you know, toward the climax of the film, uh, Phil has been killed by Chucky. And then uh, Joanne, the, the foster mom, has been killed. And then Kyle has to go after Andy because Chucky wants to transfer his soul into Andy's body. And then they get to the foster home and everything else. And then that's when you get the snare drum military march almost. And I guess this to signify, with, with the, watching it with the film, it kind of works. But at the same time, it don't. It's kind of telling that Kyle, the, the hero, the heroine of the film, is... is on a mission. She's on a mission to save Andy to go after him yeah. to stop Chucky from what he's doing. I still feel like it was out of place. Even, even watching it with the film, it was out of place. Even watching it with the film, I felt like it just did not make sense. And that they could have used, you know, when she marched up there, maybe put that snare drum in there. Or another scene, which, you know, they might have could have slipped it in and it would have made more sense. But the scene in which they did have the snare drum... Uh, part of the factory to me just made no sense it's just and, and, and nonsensical I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that one and then they get to the factory and the music gets back to the grandiosa because this is this is where the movie really takes a hold of the funhouse effect almost well not effect it, the more funhouse feel well, and I think that is because it was centered around Chucky at this point right and I mean that's when Chucky is trapped inside the doll. He's not going to be able to get out, so he becomes even more enraged than what he normally is, and he he's then vowed to kill Andy and Kyle. And, and you think about the factory. The factory was kind of like a fun house. It was right. maze like. They had all these machines going off. Um, you know, they were trying to navigate around all of that. The good guy doll boxes they were trying to navigate. So, you know, I think that that was well placed, and the way that that the music reflected that was a good choice. Now, there was a scene where the technician is about to get killed. Now, for the track on the score itself, started off a little differently than what is in the film. It's, it's, a, it, it, it's a little bit lighter. Again, we're going back to the it, it's too light in, in parts. And this one started off a little lighter than what's in the film. And I believe some of the tracks kind of rearranged a little bit. Yeah, too. the balance to me wasn't there. So there's some places where it was too over the top. And then you have other places that it wasn't enough, as you just mentioned. I felt like the score needed more balance in the in the movie. The balance was off. Yeah, and that was. It also goes back to what I said before. The score needed to be darker, because there was a lot of moments, like the scene where Chucky is coming up the 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 conveyor belt, conveyor belt, like. conveyor belt thing after Andy, and he's you know he's racing. The music's big and action, but it needed to be darker. It was too much like an action I think movie. If they would have maybe added a little bit more bass sounds to it instead of having the light, airy, you know. The more brass. Uh, light, lighter um, voices, it would have brought in that little more sinister sound. I, I, and you could do that. It would have balanced it nicely because right. there's, a, there's a fine balance there. Uh, I do feel like there are pieces uh, that they needed to add, those lower voices. And by doing so, it would have amped up his feeling. Right. And I, I agree with you. And then the uh, we get to the climax of the film where... Even back in the day, I thought this was such a bad idea where they stick the hose into Chucky's mouth and his head swells up like a big giant balloon and explodes and little Chucky bits are going all over the place. Chucky bits. <laughs> horrible, Chris. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, that's what a it bad is. description. Well, that's what it is. It's little Chucky bits flying everywhere. Uh, it was even worse for the third film, which I'll get to that in Nasty. just a second. Um, so little Chucky bits are flying through the air and then, you know, the music's big. And, and there's a moment in there where the score is really, really dark. It's, it's kind of the score is kind of, you know, descending down a little bit. They should have had that feeling throughout the whole film. But it wasn't there. It was there at the end. Yeah, I agree. I, I like this, how the score was at the end of the film. Um, as opposed to how it was at the beginning. I think that... Um, it was a lot better there at the end. Uh, I don't know if it's because of design, or I don't know if maybe it's the, because maybe the terror that was going on. Maybe, um, but I felt like maybe if that was you know kind of applied to the beginning of the the film, in my mind, it would have made the score uh, work for the movie a lot better. It would have. It would have. Now, the the ending in 
the ending starts up and it starts off basically recounting almost the very grandioso epic opening track. Now, in the soundtrack version, it's a lot longer, it's a lot extended, and then it goes into the pan flutes and the the child toy sounds. In the film, the child toy Chucky's theme comes in a little earlier because there was an alternate ending to the film. Oh, I didn't know that. What happens is it shows Andy and Kyle coming out, and they're, they're like, you know, Kyle, where are we going? Home. Where's home? Andy, I have no idea. Then we go back inside the factory, and the camera kind of follows some of the tubes and some of the things, and then you see the uh, the remaining of Chucky there, and it gets put into the the face molding area. And basically what happens is all that Chucky blood and everything else goes into the plaster or the plastic or whatever and creates a new Chucky face. And when the machine opens up and you see the Chucky face there, kind of looks at the camera and smiles just a little bit, and then the film ends. Yeah, see, I think I would have liked that better because then that would explain what happened to him. Right. Uh, now, although in the third one, they, they created a whole new way of how Chucky comes back and everything else, which is pretty much almost the exact same, but it's also different a little bit. I would have liked that ending better. And I, I from what I'm gathering, the, what the way the score was, that was the ending up until... Maybe when they... Right up until release. Yeah. Well, you know, how they do the test audiences and what. Right. They and they probably were like, it. oh, you know, let, let's have Chucky dead and blah, blah. Or it could have been studio. It could have been studio saying, hey, let's just do it this way. And I mean, I, 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 I get that. I mean, that happens all of the time, even with films I work on. So, you know, I sat there and as I've said before, I, you know, one of the things that I do is I like to see if I could visualize a different score for the movie and I could in this instance. Um, I was not happy with the score. So um, I sat there, and when I started watching it, I'm like, hmm, I could, I could see this differently. Or, um, yeah, I could hear this differently. So, Like we always do, we always break it down to three different criteria. Does it work for the film? I don't think so. There, there's a lot of moments I'm going to say no. I don't think it there, works. There, I mean, like the the you disagree on the opening. I see the opening does work. There were a lot of moments with this film for me. The score does work, but the, a lot of the time, a bigger say eighty percent of the time, it doesn't. And you know, as I was just saying, uh, I could I could imagine a different score for the film, and um, I was I felt like the score needed more balance in places. I, I granted it, you know, I don't quite understand the the position of the sound designer and how they balance that stuff out but I feel like the score itself could have been more balanced uh, a, a lot of the time throughout the film so uh, yes it was easy for me to, to put somebody else's music in my mind in this movie and it would make it to me more effective now now some of the best parts of the score for you listening to it I only had one which was? It was actually the the scene where she was singing the lullaby. Okay, yeah, we were talking about that, I like and that. I, where I went off on the tangent about Godfather. Yeah, so she's humming this little theme to Andy, singing a little song, and the score actually started reflecting what she. It was helping it almost. And see, yes, and, and it was so creepy. That is why I liked it because it was intelligent. You could tell that it was uh, thought out and intelligently done when they added that element to the score. So basically what it did was it added to the scene by amping up that moment. Now, which which score piece do you think is my favorite? Uh, which score piece is your favorite? Why are you putting me on a spot like this, Chris? <laughs> <laughs> Gotta make it interesting. Gotta make it interesting. It's Chucky's theme. No, 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 no. Which score piece in general? Like, which scene? The beginning? <laughs> no, I actually like the, the labyrinth piece, oh, the, the one with the bongos. I actually like that. But, well, uh, mainly because it, 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 it's it got this rhythmic chase to it. I really like the, the sound. You like chase music. I do. I really love like heist music. I do. I do. You I really like chase music. You love heist music. music. I, I like chase music more. I've always, I've always found a 
bigger fascination the chase music. So this big these big actiony scenes where the music is just going and it's going at a rhythm and there's a steady pace and there's a slight change up and it then it goes on that. Okay, straight, then, so I got a question for you then, Chris. Okay. What about seventies chase music? You like that? No. <laughs> I do not like 70s chase music. I cannot stand it. You just said you like chase music. (laughs) Not that kind of chase music. You're not funny because you are wrong for that. You know I don't like 70s music. 70s music's not bad. We're going to have to cover some of that one day, aren't we? I'm going to eat those words. Yep. (laughs) I'm going to pick one. Now, what could have been done better? We we talked about this. It could have been darker. There, There are a lot of moments, maybe... Maybe the composers should have had someone else kind of step in and give some additional music. I, as we discussed at the very beginning, I felt like he was experimenting with sound. Um, so you can tell that he didn't have the experience that he, he should have had with the orchestra. But that being said, I felt like in his score itself, he could have added a little bit more of the deeper voices. And, you know, as we were just talking about, he added all the sliding note pieces that seemed to have worked for the horror movie. And the stabbing pieces and that sort of thing, but I, I feel like that um, he could have added, you know, a bit of the lower, the lower voices to amp up that uh, that that um, thriller feel or that that feel of uh, dread that he needed to build. Uh, so in in my mind, he could have done that, and it would have made it just a little bit better. Yeah, I completely agree. I, I think there should have been a lot of moments in there where it could have been darker, bigger, bolder maybe tone it down on some instances and then bring in a, a bigger uh, base element in there. Some, some higher scarier stings in there than what was in there. But again, it was probably more that he was, this was his first big orchestra orchestral score. So he was kind of experimenting with a lot of different ideas or it could have been a time crunch. I mean, it, yeah, there there were so many different factors going on. Or it could have been exactly what uh, you have you come across all the time is that you create this wonderful score piece and you think it sounds great, and then the director comes back and says, "No, nope, we want you to change it." I'm not going to tell you how many times that happened, but it does happen. It does happen. So. Uh, Going back, listening to the score on its own is fantastic. I I highly do. I, agree. Re- I highly recommend it. Because it, it, it tells a story from beginning to end. And it's it, it listening to it on its own, it's a great score. There are a couple of moments in there where it's like, eh, like the burial and the, the you know, the snare drum. even though the burial was out of place, it still was a good piece of music. I love the organ part of it. So, yeah, and it was great it was to good. hear that. It was good. It, it was great to hear that. Now, against the film itself, uh, there, there were a lot of moments in there where it could have dialed it back, but it also could have made it scarier. So, yeah, it kind of doesn't work for the film in a lot of places, which is sad because I was such a big fan of the score growing up and watching this film. Yeah, doesn't it? It just stinks it when you're watching it, it from a different hurts. perspective and you're like, oh, ouch, that's not This right. is one of those moments I don't like doing this podcast because ah. I, I, growing up, like I said, I was such a big fan of the score and I was so looking forward to it and then looking at it from different eyes, I'm like, ah. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't like that too much. Yeah, that kind of sucked. <laughs> so as always... Uh, thank you guys so much for listening to this. You can find us on social media on Facebook. I believe it's at measuring the score Instagram. It's measuring underscore the underscore score or just search for measuring the score and Twitter. We are at measure the score. I couldn't get measuring in there because it was too long. Or you can just send us an email at measuring the score at gmail.com. What at? I, I was just saying you can email us at. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> the email address is measuring the score at gmail.com. Thank so you. if you have any scores that you think we need to listen to, just find us on social media, send us a quick little message, or just you want to tell us what you think of the podcast, let us know. We would love to hear from you. If you have a if you are a composer and you have a score you want us to listen to along with the film, let us know. We'd be glad to hear from you. So for Measuring the Score, I'm Chris Lott. And I'm Leslie Lott. Thank you for listening.